Det er liksom the mother ship, altså, som vi skal få, få høre nå. Mm-hmm. Vi har nemlig med oss en solution expert fra Google UK, og ryktene sier at han er et fyrverkeri av inspiration. Gi han en volumiøs og hoderystende applaus, Kirk Vallis! Hey. Who's still drunk? <laughs> Good, excellent. Um, well, so my my job at Google is to uh, is to try and get everybody in the organisation to think and behave a bit more like the kind of stuff that's needed for ideas like that, and to get us to think more creatively about our everyday business challenges for ourselves, but also for our closest partners, like many of you in this room uh, today. And one of the things that I've learned along the way, I used to work for an innovation consultancy, consultancy called What If? And one of the things that I, um, that I, the biggest business lesson I learned there was that it's people who innovate, not process, not computers. And even at Google, some people don't like it when I say that, but uh, it's people who innovate. So Great ideas come from us and come from human beings. So that's what today's about. Five top tips for you to get you all to be even more creative around your everyday business challenges, no matter where you work, what your job is. Uh, but I think we should get the energy going this morning. It's, uh, it was a late night for some of you, um, so let's get the energy going. So what I'd like you all to do is to stand up and turn to face um, a partner. And I'm gonna, um, if you could join me back on stage, that'd be great. So if I could ask you to turn and face a partner, if I could ask you just to look, look at them square in the face, give them a big smile this morning. Everybody give a big smile. There we go. Good, good, good. If I could ask you to um, uh, pay them a compliment. Come on, it's a, it's a Friday. We're all being paid to be here. You look fantastic today. It's nothing worth waking up for you. There we go. Good, good, good. <laughs> See, the energy has risen already, which is great. If I could ask you now just to... Stay looking at them straight on in the face. If I could ask you just to raise your arms up to shoulder height. Just raise them a little bit more. Now, if I could ask you just to lean very slightly to your left, which means you're leaning in different uh, directions. There we go. And now, finally, go in and give each other a big manly hug. Okay, thank you. There we go. Cheers. Thanks. Grab yourselves a seat. Ah. So the energy is, look at that, the energy has risen already. There's a couple of reasons why, um, why I do that exercise at the start of this session. And the fir- first reason is it's just a bit of fun, right? We're being paid to be here today, which is fantastic. So let's, um, let's enjoy it. Let's have some fun. And there is some real science uh, connected to that when it comes to having ideas as well, which we'll get into um, in a moment. But also as well, um, it's to help me to make my very first uh, point or principle when it comes to having great ideas. Because when I asked you to do that, you would have all had a reaction. Some of you would have been thinking, thank you, Kirk. I've been wanting to have bodily contact with this person since I arrived. Um, and for others, you would have been thinking, please let the world open up and swallow me whole. I've just recovered from agoraphobia. Get me out of here. Um, but for most of us, it would have just felt slightly uncomfortable. Not because we're against hugging people, but in the work context, it's not the kind of things that we do every single day. And at Google, we believe that this is vital when it comes to having ideas. Um, Because we have a a motto at Google, which was um, developed from the very first day that Sergey and Larry set up the company, and it still exists today, which is to get uncomfortably excited. Innovation and great ideas come from being uncomfortably excited. If you don't have a feeling to the ideas that you're having, then they're probably not anything new. I would argue that it's that, those butterflies in your stomach that you get when you are doing something slightly different, slightly new for the first time. And we need to recognize these as being a great thing because that's where good ideas come from. And, I, and I'd urge you to, uh, to, to acknowledge that when you are feeling that within your businesses, when you're about to try something new, a different direction, a different strategy, it probably suggests that it's something you haven't done before. But more importantly, it probably suggests that it's something that your competitors haven't done before um, as well. And there is a safe word, because if you're just uncomfortable, that's not good. Um, but, being, but if you are excited, so if you're feeling slightly strange, you've got those butterflies, but you're still 
feeling excited about the, the ideas that you're having, then that is a great place to be. So uh, point number one when it comes to having great ideas is recognize being uncomfortably excited as a great thing. Um, if we're going to talk about the human side of innovation, then we should get into the brain. <laughs> um, and um, before, I, before I get into the brain, is anyone here a neuroscientist or a brain scientist? Anyone? Good. I have asked that question before, and people have put their hands up when I worked with some chemists, and they said, yes, we are. Um, so uh, just to say, the, uh, the um, information I'm going to give you on the brain is the full extent of my knowledge, all right? Um, but let me ask you a question, and please just fire it out as loud as you can, because you don't have mics. Where are you when you have your best ideas, your best thinking? What are you doing? Sleeping. Someone said sleeping. What else? Running. Yeah, running's one. I'm, mine's cycling. Yeah, what else? In the shower, lots of showers every day. Uh, what else? Anything else? Anywhere else? Drunk with friends at a conference. That is a normally a good one as well. Um, but it's interesting the places that you uh, that you say you are when you're um, uh, when you're having your best ideas. It's no coincidence that you say those places, and it's also no coincidence that for the hundreds of times I've asked that question of thousands of people, no one in all seriousness has ever said at my desk, in front of my computer, when I'm being paid to have ideas for my business and my client. And there is a very real science behind this, because in your brain, your brain is, can be sliced and diced into lots of different ways, but when it comes to uh, having ideas, uh, your brain has a conscious and the subconscious parts of your brain. The conscious part of your brain is just 12% of your brain. It's the bit that does the fetching and the carrying. It's the water carrier. The other 88% of your brain is subconscious. And this is where all of the ingredients and stimulus, every piece of information that you've ever been exposed to is in that subconscious brain somewhere. And joining the two is a doorway called the reticular activating system, or the RAS. And depending on how open or closed this doorway is, dictates the conscious brain's ability to access all of that great stimulus to come up with new and different ideas. And depending on how open or, and how open or closed that doorway is, is dictated by the brain state that you are in at any given time. I'm going to just very briefly introduce you to the four main brain states. And you will be in one of these states at, every single mo at any single moment that you are alive. And the first one is called beta, or beta state, if we're in the US. Um, and this is the state that you are in when you're at work most of the time. When you're getting stuff done, you're in task completion mode, you're trying to reply to emails, you're answering the phone, you're eating your lunch, you're having a conversation with a colleague as well. This is the state that you are in when you get stuff done. But recognize, the doorway is fully closed. No information can pass between the subconscious and the conscious at all. Next state, alpha state. This is the state you are in when you are relaxed, when you are running, when you are cycling, repetitive, excuse me, repetitive physical motion. Um, when you're in the pub, bar, restaurant, just relaxing with friends, in the lounge, in, at home with friends and family, uh, this is the state that you are in. The doorway is only slightly open, more than enough though, for information to pass from the subconscious to the conscious to help you to come up with new and different options for your business. Next state, theta or theta state. This is the state you are in just before you go to sleep and just as you wake up. Um, in this state, the doorway is nicely open. Lots and lots of information can pass through. And lastly, delta state. This is the state you are in when you're asleep. In this state, the doorway is fully open. It couldn't be more open. The amount of information that can pass through is at an incredible rate. So, four brain states. Two of them are absolutely no use to us whatever, whatsoever in business when it comes to being creative or coming up with new and different ideas. What do you think those two might be? So delta was one, so we got one there, and the other one was beta. So actually delta, common sense would tell us that delta should be the best state. The doorway is fully open, the information can pass through at an incredible rate. And that is true. Unfortunately though, there's nothing you can do about it because you're asleep. Um, that might change. Organizations like Samsung um, are doing lots of work into this kind of space, and, um, and the likes of Google as well. And I'm sure that in 10, 10 years' time or so, we'll all be sitting here um, with organizations being able to harness the power of our brains when we're asleep. But recognize that you need to be in this state for about four hours a night uh, for your brain to process everything that's happened. Fantastic state. Nothing you can do about it in business. Um, even at Google, 
We are yet to justify going and sleeping for three hours to sleep off that hangover. Um, uh, so it's all about alpha state. Beta state, I think, no, it needs no explanation. It's a great state to get stuff done. You're in completion mode, but you do not come up with any new um, ideas in that state. And theta state is called the inspiration state. And, um, and it's a brilliant state. Those of you, has anyone ever woken from a dream in the middle of the night? And you can remember the dream perfectly. Then you fall back asleep, and then the next day, halfway through the day, you can't remember it at all. And that's because at that point that you woke up, you were in theta state. But then the next day, once you're getting into work mode, you're fully in beta, um, and the door is fully uh, closed. At Google, we have sleep pods that some of you may have heard of or seen in some of our offices. And this isn't to help you to go and sleep that hangover off. What it's there to do is to try and give you a 20-minute cycle for you to multiply the number of opportunities that you have to be in theta state every single day. But the state that is the best for us in business is alpha state. And this is my second point, is that you need to get into alpha state if you want to come up with new and different thinking for your business or your organization. So things like going for a run, so, and take the principles of this. Now, at some organizations, it's perfectly fine. Again, at Google, we ab absolutely have the permission to go and use the gym or go for a run or exercise whenever we like because we fundamentally believe that going and doing that exercise engages the right part of our brain to help us to think differently about our challenges. But in, your, but in whatever your organization or the culture that you work in, go for a walk. Go for a walk. My number one thing would be to recognize that where you spend 90% of your working day at your desk is also where you spend 90% of your time in beta states. So get away from your desk if you are trying to come up with new and different uh, thinking around it. Go to a different place. Fresh air and natural light, two of the most um, easiest ways to help the brain get into that state. Also laughing which is why it comes back to that point of the exercise we did at the beginning. It's impossible for your brain to, to not be in alpha state when you are genuinely happy or laughing or excited about something. So point number two is recognize the need to be in alpha state. You are kidding yourself if you think you can sit at your desk in beta state with a million things to do on a list and still come up with genuinely new and exciting options for your um, organization. And when you're in alpha state, you, um, it helps you to get into this thing, um, a different way of thinking. And who do you think is best at getting into alpha state? Who are the most creative people we know? Kids, yeah, not pixies. They're about this tall, but they are kids. It's not, it's, not, it's not dwarfs or pixies. And kids, and what's the one question that kids ask all the time? It's one word, in fact. Why? They live in a world with no boundaries. They haven't learned the rules yet. Hands up here if you weren't a child. Good, okay, I do wait for organizations like Google and Samsung to one day put their hand up and say, yes, I was cloned at 30, here I am. Um, but no, we were all children. We all live in this wonderful world of possibility. I call it expansive thinking. And expansive thinking is fantastic, and kids do it naturally. Any of you that have ever bought a child a gift that comes in a big box, and they unwrap the gift, and they take the gift, let's say it's a bike, and they take it out of the box, and then what do they do? They play with a bloody box. The bike costs 150 euros. The box costs nothing. Should have just wrapped up an empty box. Um, I did that for my godson last year. He, uh, the, bo the box very quickly uh, became a, uh, a car. It then became a boat. They turned it into a mountain and climbed it. Unfortunately, it then became a toilet. We had to stop that game. Uh, um, but where do kids go when they grow up, as they're growing up? School. We go to school. And unfortunately, at school, we start to be taught that there is only one right answer for almost everything. And this wonderful world of expansive thinking starts to get knocked out of us, and we start to become more naturally reductive. Um, there was a, a study done in 2007, 2008, and um, I haven't found a more updated one, but I don't think it needs it, in the US, and it says that um, in, the, in the U.S. state education system, the average child by the age of 18 has sat over 3,000 test exams or tasks where there is only one right answer. And then it gets worse because we go to work and we are paid, rewarded, promoted, employed in the first place for our ability to be reductive, for our ability to make decisions and get things done and analyze. 
and um, you go home, check your CV, your resume, your curriculum vitae, and I guarantee you most of the things that you sell yourself on will be on where you have managed to get things done, where you have made decisions and analyzed and judged. Very rarely in this, in this, in this, in this age, and I think this will change in, in quick time, do people put on their CVs where they have failed, you know, or things that you've tried that didn't go well. And, um, and that's because we're inherently conditioned to be reductive. And I'm not saying that being reductive is a bad thing. You have to spend 90% of your time being reductive in business. Otherwise, you, your businesses would fail. Even at Google, we spend most of our time being reductive. We have to. But what we do is we recognize the need and the time and the place for us to spend just a small amount of time being expansive around new opportunities or new thinking in order for us to have options in our organization. Uh, anyone know a guy called Scott Forstall? Anyone heard of a guy called Scott Forstall? He, um, so he was responsible for the iOS um, operating system for the iPhone. Very smart guy. Uh, developed the, the platform there. He's recently left the organization. He went on to Maps, and um, that didn't work so well for Apple. Um, that's my one dig from, from Google. Um, but, um, but a really smart guy. And he was interviewed, and he was asked, what is it that Apple look for when they're employing people? And he said, obviously, there's the technical ability to do the job you're employed for. But beyond that, every adult human being has what he calls a fixed mindset. And what he means by that is that every adult on this, uh, in, the Western, in the Western business world has the ability to be reductive, to judge and analyze. We're bloody good at it. Um, and we can all come up with reasons why things can't work. Smart, successful people do that with ease. And he said, but at Apple, and I think I'd agree from a Google point of view as well, he said, we look for people that have a growth mindset. And what he meant by that was just simply people who, um, ha who recognize the opportunity, the small moments during the, every working day where they need to think expansively around a challenge and come up with new and different thinking without judging. So point number three, you need to be expansive. Recognize the need to think differently about your challenge without judgment, without analysis, just allowing yourself to look for possibility. I call it being childlike, not childish. This isn't about just breaking rules for the sake of it, but it is about being childlike, being more connecting with that child that we all were. So point number three, let's get expansive around new thinking. When you listen to some of the grown-up speakers today um, who are going to share with you tons of inspiration about things that have happened in their organizations and, um, and their worlds, then I encourage you to get into an expansive mindset um, around that and think, how can I take the principles and make them work for me? So how do we get expansive? How do we? And I think it's bloody simple. You just have to signal. If you want other people around you to join you in building ideas or new thinking, you need to signal, signal, signal. Tell them how you want them to be. It's amazing how often in business people use language that doesn't, um, that doesn't encourage people to help them grow their ideas. If I asked you to, uh, if I gave you an idea and then asked you, what do you think? What do you reckon I'm signaling? Am I signaling expansive or reductive? So I think it depends by, there is some variation in this by culture, but in, by and large, I would say that that is a signal to judge. Judge me, yes, no, right, wrong. So be, think about the signals that you use in your everyday language when you want people to help you to grow ideas. Because I guarantee you that if you have one person in a group, in a session, who isn't helping you to grow ideas, but is judging and being reductive, then it ruins it for everyone. I've got a great story that I learned when I was at um, What If, and I won't own it because it's not mine and it's not even What Ifs. It's from a guy called Kurt Colson, who's the CEO of the Stanford Research Institute, a really uh, innovative organization in Silicon Valley. And he um, speaks passionately about the need for signaling. And he, um, and he, because he says that when it comes to innovation and creativity in business, he said there's acceptable behaviors and unacceptable behaviors. And those people that, uh, that demonstrate unacceptable behaviors are like a cancer to your organization. Excuse the language, but that's how passionately he talks about it. And he tells a story to bring this to life, which I guarantee will stay in your mind for a long time. And he says, so I'll tell it as he tells it. I want you to imagine you are no longer in this fantastic room, in this fantastic hotel, in this great city. You are now in the USA. 
you're in California, you're in LA, you are in the Hollywood Hills. You are at a Hollywood pool party. The great and the good of Hollywood are there. There's Brad. Hello, Brad. There's Angelina. Hello, Angelina. Um, you've got your favorite drink in your hand. There are people in the distance talking about you. You know that they're talking about you. You can't quite make out what they're saying, but you know that it's great. And you can just smell the waft of the barbecue coming over the infinity pool overlooking the Hollywood Hills. And you think, I'm going to tuck into that food, but not before I have a dip. So you put your drink down, you walk over to the pool where you derobe to gasps. <gasps> because you are so toned, you are so bronzed, you look fantastic. And you are just about to execute a perfect swan dive into the pool when you see them. They're there, they're floating on the top of the pool. There's 10 of them. They're brown, they're shiny. They look like sausages, they're not sausages. There's 10 poos in that swimming pool. And the question that Kurt asks at this point is who would dive into that swimming pool with 10 poos in there? Anyone? I do get some qualifying questions at this point. Oh, is someone, someone debating it? How drunk am I is a good question. Um, are they celebrity poos is another one. Um, but I think we're good. I'm, you've all passed. Yes, of course, you wouldn't dive into that pool. So you get the pool attendant over, and he fishes out seven of those poos. There's just three left. Would anyone dive in now? No. So he comes back, empty net. We don't ask where those seven poos went over the fence, I think. Um, comes back, he fishes out two more poos, and there's just one poo left in that pool. Would anyone dive in now? And the moral of the story is, it only takes one poo to ruin a Hollywood pool party for everyone. And it only takes one shit or one person behaving like a shit by being reductive when you need them to be expansive around your business challenge to ruin that session, that conversation, that brainstorm for everyone. We, are, we don't wake up in the morning and go, nah, I'm going to go to work today, kill a few ideas, that's how I roll. Um, but recognize that as adults, we are naturally reductive. So if you are working on a challenge and you want people to be expansive with you for a small amount of time, then you need to tell them. Don't, there's no, I, I could give you loads of science. You could use the room. The environment can help to signal how it is. But the best way is just to say, don't judge this idea, right? Just help me build it for a while, and then we'll judge it later. Um, so that's point number four, is the need, uh, point number four, yeah, is the need to signal to people how you want them to be. If you want them to be expansive and get into beta state with you around a challenge. Last one is to have a light touch. So let's play a, um, a quick game, all right? This game um, is called Oh Shit. And uh, I'll tell you why it's called Oh Shit in a moment. But um, I'm going to tell you a story. And, um, and I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to ask my, uh, my colleague and f good friend here, Elizabeth, to the, the, the mic should just work. So I'm going to tell a story, but I don't know where it's going, because Elizabeth is going to throw in random words. Okay? So as I tell the story, uh, Elizabeth will throw in random words, and I need to incorporate that into my story straight away. As soon as I've incorporated the word, throw, uh, throw in another one. Um, so nice, fast-paced is how this is going um, to work. I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, they've rehearsed this. This has all been done before. So just to ensure that that isn't the case, I'm going to let you help me build the story. So who am I in this story? Anyone, fact or fiction in the world? Shout it out. I'm a firefighter. Of course I am. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm a firefighter. Where am I in the world? Somewhere you wouldn't expect a firefighter to be. I'm in the Bahamas. And what am I doing in the Bahamas? Swimming. So I'm a firefighter in the Bahamas swimming. Right, okay, we're going to give this a go. Ready with the random words? Good, okay. So, uh, so I'm a firefighter and um, I'm on vacation. So I've come to the Bahamas. The firefighter salary has improved drastically over the last few years. Astronaut. Um, sorry? Astronaut. Astronaut. Um, and uh, I'm there with my friend who's an astronaut. So we're both taking our vacation time. It's, to be fair, he's paid more than me because he earns more money. Um, and we are sit laying underneath a, a, a sun umbrella just to get some shade. Cowboy it, is, boots. It, it is boiling. Um, and, but it's especially boiling because I have my lucky cowboy boots on, which I use when uh, I towel. go on holiday to attract the ladies. Uh, towel. And, sorry? Towel. 
uh, a towel, and I um, and also as well wrapped around my head is is a towel because I'm so used to wearing my firefighter's hat that I am um, that I just that I just can't um, get away from it. So, um, but then I see a balloon and a young child who's lost his balloon. He's running along the beach. So I, I jump into firefighter mode <laughs> and I run down the beach uh, to to catch this balloon in my flowered swimming shorts. Um, Tenuous link sunglasses. there, but we'll keep going with that. And my sunglasses fall off as I'm running, and I step on them and I crush them. Ah, oh, I'm in tears Wig. with this. What's that? Wig. Um, and, um, and not only that, the towel falls off and it uh, just exposes my beautiful multicolored wig. I think we'll stop there, yeah. shall we? There we go. A round of applause for Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Okay, that, that game was called Oh Shit, because you are now going to do exactly the same as what I just did. Oh Shit. So, good people, if I could ask you just to stand up and turn to face a partner again, uh, same ones as you were before. I'd like you to label yourself person A and person B. This is the easiest thing you're going to do today. A and B, you got it? Person A, person A, you are going to tell the story, all right? Um, but... If you just listen to me for a second, person A, you're going to tell the story, but you're not a firefighter or anything like that. I just want you to start the story with, I was walking down the street one day when. And at that point, person B, you throw in random words, okay? As soon as they, then person A must incorporate the random word. As soon as they have person B, throw in another one and keep it coming thick and fast, just like Elizabeth did. When you hear this noise, waka waka, woo woo. I want you to swap over, and person B, you then tell a story. I was walking down the street one day. Person A, you throw in new and different random words. Okay, we're just going to spend a minute each way on this. Away you go. I was walking down the street one day when... Waka waka, woo woo! Swap over, swap over, quick pace. Lots of quick words being thrown in. Okay, stop there. Give yourselves a round of applause and grab a seat. Good, good, good. Uh, oh, and the energy has improved again. Alpha State was engaged during that game. Nice, fun exercise. Um, but I've got a question for you. What was, um, what was easier? Was it easier to tell the story or was it easier to throw in random words? Story, story story, random words, some of you. Actually, this, I did it too quickly because I didn't give enough chance for the, um, uh, for the random words. But when I do that, 90% of the time, people say it's easier to tell the story. Okay? And it's, um, it's, uh, there is a science behind it. But throwing in truly random words is quite difficult. Everybody starts with confidence, like, mmm, banana. <laughs> and then you lose any ability to think of any word in any language. And then you start trying to help them with the story. It was raining. Umbrella. I need to get somewhere quickly. A taxi. Um, or you start looking around the room. Camera. Stage. Water. Uh, screen. Um, or you get into a river of thinking and you start going for a subject. It's like a horse, cow, sheep. And you're in a farmyard. Ran truly random words, very difficult. Whereas um, telling the story. Did any of you know where the story was going? Did any of you care? No. And that's the point of having a light touch. We are brilliant at doing this in, in, in situations like this or having fun with friends and family, but we are awful at it in business. In business, just let go of the outcome for a while. We, we're so smart and, in, and, and successful, we think five steps ahead about all the reasons why something wouldn't, wouldn't work. 
I just suggest that you have a light touch. Let go of the outcome. Don't be wedded to it and be comfortable in the moment like you were that game when it comes to new ideas or new thinking. Just explore it for a while. It's safe. A bad idea has never hurt anyone. Execution of a bad idea can, but when it's just ideas, it's just options. So that's me. Um, Five top tips I, I shared for you. I encourage you to try and dial these up throughout today, but also when you get back into your businesses uh, next week. Uh, get uncomfortably excited. Recognize that feeling. Uh, engage alpha states, all right? Think more, what am I doing? What, what's the, the situation I'm in when I'm outside of work? How can I create a bit of that in work as well? Um, expansive, not reductive. Recognize just 10% of the time that you need to be expansive around um, around new thinking or new opportunities. Signal how you want people to be. Don't let anyone poo in your pool. All right, okay, we'll ruin it for everybody. And last but not least, have a light touch, okay? Just when it be childlike, not childish. So that's it from me. Um, it all starts with you. Whether you think you can or you can't, either way, you're probably right. One of my most favorite quotes from um, Henry Ford. Um, it's up to you if you want to change the culture of your organizations when it comes to innovation and being, um, and being creative. But more importantly than that, I want to end on a song. We started with a song from our great hosts, and we're going to end on a song. I love karaoke, and I'm going to get one of you to join me in some karaoke on this stage. All right, we've got the mic. We've got, the, uh, we've got the audio, we've got the words, we are, um, we've got the audio, we've got the words. We're doing Kiki D and Elton John, don't go breaking my heart, all right? I can do either, I'm brilliant at both, um, so it's up to you. I've already chosen who that person is going to be, all right? Um, because under one of your chairs, don't look now, under one of your chairs is a post-it note, and it says on it, it's you, okay? In a moment, don't look yet, don't look yet. In a moment, I'm going to get you to grab that post-it, and if it's you, I want you to wave it in the air, push everyone out the way as you come running to the stage to join me in a great song, and the rest of the audience will applaud us as we sing off stage. Are you ready for this? Look now. Have a look. I wouldn't do that to you. It's not there. It's not there at all, but it does... Just reinforce that last put that first point again, because if you didn't have butterflies at the big hug, you would have had butterflies then. That's probably just uncomfortable, not uncomfortably excited, but recognize it as a good thing. Thank you for your time this morning. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, my name is Kirk, as he said. Give me a shout. Thank you very much. Where do you get the energy to wake up us like that? Um, I think it's just a, a passion. I fundamentally believe that it's about us as people who make a difference when it comes to creativity. So lots of, even in an organization like Google where we have tons of data and analysis, unless you've got the human behaviors that go with it, then nothing happens. So I guess it's just born out of pure 100% you know, belief in it. If you, uh, you can summarize your, uh, your speech, um in a brief manner, how would you summarize it? So it's, it all comes from that, the, the behavioral side of innovation. So uh, we, um, I, the, my former um, boss, a guy called Matt Kingdon at uh, What If, he, um, he had a, a, a passion and he used to always say that behavior eats process for breakfast. And, um, and so that's where that comes from. So I absolutely know that everybody's gonna be tired this morning. They come um, and so, for them to enjoy the, and really be able to process the rest of the day's material. It's all about us actually waking up, getting into the right brain state, having a bit of fun. And I think in business, we, we, we forget about this connection between having fun and smiling and, and the ability for us to truly think differently about our, um, our work. So that's what today was about, was not trying to show off all the things that get publicized about companies like Google, but actually to show that we can all be more creative in whatever we do. How are you enjoying the media conference so far? Yeah, fantastic, isn't it? What a great, um, so lots of great people. I thought the Coca-Cola presentation just now was inspirational, you know? It's just fantastic for an organization like that that keep, um, you know, that essentially sell soft drinks, but actually for the, the work that goes into it. So it's good, the party last night seemed to, be, um, seemed to be good. I think some of them went on quite late, so that was good, but everybody was in there on time, which just shows the commitment for the people to kind of 
learn and just take in new and different points of view, which is which is brilliant and something that the um, I think the Nordic community constantly, constantly do more than anyone else in Europe. Are you partying tonight? No, I've got to go back. I've been in been in San Francisco for the last two weeks, so I'm going home to my bed tonight, unfortunately. But you're content with yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was good. A few glasses of champagne, and um, everyone's happy. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Thanks man. Cheers.